Yes, the next presenter is Hillary Hermosada. Wow. <laughs> I think I just changed her ethnic background. Uh, <laughs> and I'm German too, okay. Uh, she'll, she'll be talking her uh, complex patient, her uh, Grand Rounds case uh, involves a patient with bilateral total knee arthroplasty. Um, I'm going to present a patient case involving a bilateral total knee arthroplasty. Mrs. Ella is an 81-year-old female who was admitted to the hospital for bilateral total knee arthroplasty on June 25, 2007. Patty is retired and loves sewing, gardening, and enjoys playing bridge with her friends. She's a fun-loving new great-grandmother and wants to get back to her active life. Before having the surgery, Patty attended a pre-op meeting with the PTs, head nurse, caseworkers, and doctors to discuss any questions about therapy and general care after, after the surgery. Patty has three children, one daughter and two sons. The daughter lives 20 minutes away and helps her mother daily, and both the sons live approximately 45 minutes away. Patty relies mostly on her daughter for grocery shopping, and her sons visit once a week to help with general household repairs to maintain an, the upkeep of her house. She lives alone in a ranch style home and there are five steps to enter with one handrail. Patty is able to cook her own meals, do her own laundry, and do some light dusting. She ambulates with a single point cane for household and community distances. However, since the arthritis in her knees has worsened, she uses a rolling walker for support and stability. Since Patty was born in 1926, there are many, ed many educational differences between her and I, which affected how I instructed her on the exercises. For example, my instructions were clear, concise, and in terminology that she understood. Physical therapists are responsible for educating the patient and the family regarding the intervention so the patient can fully participate in the therapy program. By educating the family, the patient's daughter will was willing to help with the home exercise program and the physical therapy intervention. Here are some general changes that occur as people age, decreased range of motion, decreased strength, and the presence of comorbidities. These factors can greatly affect the physical therapy intervention. The patient's motivation was also taken into consideration that she's motivated and ready to participate in physical therapy in order to return to her daily activities. Patty's past medical history includes diabetes, diabetes mellitus, nuclear stress test that was performed one month prior to the surgery, hypothyroidism, osteoarthritis of bilateral knees. Complications from type 2 diabetes include heart disease, stroke, kidney disease, and neuropathies, which are most common in the hands and the feet. The patient's past medical history also included hypertension and high cholesterol, which puts, puts her at a risk for having a heart attack. So Patty's doctors used a nuclear stress test to ensure that her heart will be able to withstand surgery. The purpose of this stress test is to determine the heart's perfusion capability. It shows how well the blood gets to the heart muscle. Hypothyroidism can be caused by various factors, including autoimmune disease, thyroid surgery, and various medications. Patty developed hypothyroidism due to a partial thyroidectomy at the age of 50, with no reason given in the medical chart. Signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism include high cholesterol, muscle aches, stiffness, and unexplained weight gain. Complications include heart problems and mental health mental health issues such as depression. Depression is very common among the elderly, therefore when examining this patient, I made sure that she didn't develop any signs of depression due to hypothyroidism. These are just two examples of complications from hypothyroidism that I kept in mind while treating Patty. Levothyroxine is one example of a medication used to treat hypothyroidism, which will be discussed in further detail later. Pain, stiffness, swelling, and crepitus are a few signs, signs and symptoms of osteoarthritis. P 
Patty's main complaint is her bilateral lower extremity pain, which has limited her functional capabilities. This slide shows the medications Patty was taking during her hospital stay. Due to the time constraint, I have only planned to discuss four medications that I perceived as important. Omestartin is an angiotensin II receptor medication that is administered to control Patty's hypertension. I highlighted the side effects that may have affected physical therapy. For example, dizziness is very important and something I monitored when she stood up for the first time after surgery. Amaryl is a drug that is used to treat type 2 diabetes. Some side effects include dizziness, decreased sensation, nausea, vomiting, and headaches. This decreased sensation is important since she has a history of diabetes. Therefore, when taking Patty's, Patty's history, I made sure to ask her about sensation prior to surgery to determine if there are any deficits. Levothyroxine is a hormone replacement drug that is used to control her hyperthyroidism. The side effects from this drug include GI intolerance and rash. Xanax is a common medic medication used to treat anxiety. The side effects include ataxia, lightheadedness, drowsiness, slurred speech, confusion, depression, and blurred vision. For example, ataxia can be, these effects can greatly impact their physical therapy. For example, ataxia can increase a person's risk for falling due to the inability to coordinate their muscle function. Since Patty was active before her surgery, I would not expect her to exhibit an ataxic gait pattern. However, if she, did, if she did, I would document the gait pattern and refer back to the doctor if I felt her medication was causing her to develop an ataxic gait pattern. The pre-op class is designed so that patients will play an active role in the rehab process. It's designed by the physicians and the therapists to educate patients on the post-surgical rehab program. Each patient who attended the class received an information packet describing the various exercises, explaining the purpose of a CPM, and the typical protocol for the hospital. A patient who chooses elective orthopedic surgery will typically stay in the hospital for about three to five days. The therapist plays an important role in examining the patient after surgery, explaining the goals and the next step in the rehab process. Many people don't think about the side effects of anesthesia and how it will impact their recovery. Patty exhibited weakness and changes in sensation that could be caused by anesthesia. The three types of anesthesia are general, local, and regional anesthesia. General anesthesia is used more for surgeries such as joint replacement and amputations. Local anesthesia is used more for minor surgeries and to provide pain relief to a localized reason region. Regional anesthesia provides pain relief to specific regions such as the lower half of the body and there are two types of regional anesthesia, a spinal and an epidural block. The adverse reactions for this type of anesthesia include headache, dizziness, and drowsiness. Regional anesthesia is a type of anesthesia Patty received for her surgery. She reported numbness in varying, varying areas of both lower extremities. Upon evaluation Patty's, of Patty's past medical history, I made sure that I asked about any loss of sensation prior to her surgery to get a baseline of any sensory deficits that could be from her diabetes. Indications for this surgery include limited ADLs, deformity, and osteoarthritis of the knees. Contraindications include pre-existing infection, vascular deficiency, and obesity. Obesity isn't an absolute contraindication for this surgery. However, it does complicate the rehabilitation process. The purpose of this surgery is to alleviate pain and increase the function. The benefits include increased range of motion, stability of the joint, decreased pain, and to improve the alignment of the joint. Some risks include infection and the development of blood clots. Here's a picture of the knee before and after a total knee arthroplasty. The picture on the left shows the worn away cartilage on, and on the right you can see the 
femoral and tibial components utilized in this surgery. The following slides discuss research uh, regarding total knee arthroplasty surgery. In this article, the authors researched the benefits of having both knees replaced simultaneously, sequentially, or staged. Sequential bilateral total knee arthroplasty involves replacing one knee after another, which promotes healing and decrease in pain within 12 weeks. Stage total knee arthroplasty involves separate procedures during separate hospitalizations, which requires the patient to return for a second procedure and often lengthens the rehabilitation process. A simultaneous total knee arthroplasty involves two surgeons replacing one knee at the same time. The outcomes for this procedure are similar to a sequential bilateral total knee arthroplasty. Another article that was researched compared staged versus simultaneous bilateral total knee arthroplasty to determine if there's an increased risk for developing a pulmonary embolism after surgery. The authors performed a retrospective chart review to determine the probability of the pulmonary embolism within three months after having a total knee arthroplasty. The results of this article determined that the simultaneous bilateral total knee arthroplasty has the most probability of developing a pulmonary embolism after surgery. However, these results are negligible and it's hard to make an assumption that having both knees replaced will increase your likelihood for developing a pulmonary embolism. One of the reasons I included this article was to reinforce the fact that patients should be educated on all risks prior to their surgery. Does anyone have any questions so far? Yes? Do you know uh, the three dot decision tree for this lady and her surgeon, why she decided to buy that one? Um, as far I don't, it wasn't, I didn't ask her when I had treated her as to why she had chosen to do two. Just from treating so many patients my first time with this, most people do two of them because they don't want to come back. They are too afraid of the hospital. They're too afraid of having the procedure done. That, and they think it's going to be too painful. They'll never get it done again. <laughs> Hopefully not, but that could be one reason. So yeah, as far as Patty's case, I don't know for sure as to why she chose to have both of them done. You're welcome. Said that she had some numbness uh, after anesthesia. Is that correct? Yes. How, uh, what duration after? Um, it lasted, when I had seen her on the initial evaluation, examination for the P PT part of it, I had seen her and she still had an epidural in her. So we didn't get her out of bed. We just, I just talked to her and then I came later back, later on that day, finished the examination, got her out of bed because they had removed the epidural block. So she was receiving, she was still being weaned off the anesthesia when I had gone in to see her in the morning. Uh, one other question. Uh, having a staged uh, procedure, mm -hmm. uh, Everyone's rehabilitation process is different, so you can see some people can rehab really well within three, four months, they can be back having their next one done. Um, but as far as, uh, let's see. Um, as far as what I've seen, so I've seen two, in, a, in my internship that I last did, just in, for ortho, I saw one patient who rehabbed really well after having her one knee done was going to have the other one done. Saw another patient who wasn't rehabbing well at all. He took him forever just to get to 90 degrees. And he was like, I'm going to have the other one done too. And I'm looking at him. I saw him for two and a half weeks and he didn't have 90 degrees yet. And I'm like, okay, you're going <laughs> to. And I mean, it's hard to make that judgment call. I don't see any. Personally, I'd rather have them both done. And then, but that I think is just me. I don't know. Um, I can't make that call for anybody else as to what they would do. <laughs>
Not yet, but they will be eventually, I'm sure. Last question, you talked about the PE after that. It was slightly Um, the percentages were very minute. The one percent, and then the point eight percent that they were that they showed. Um, it's very little chance of having a PE. And my take on that article was more based on your past medical history. The more comorbidities you have, the more, and your motivation. Are you willing to get out of bed that day and do therapy and do your exercises and prevent all the things that we can do to prevent developing clots. You know, and I don't think that article did a very good job as far as really showing what I wanted it to do, to say that, yes, it, it increases your risk for having pulmonary embolism, which is why you should have them done separately. But that article doesn't show that at all. You're welcome. Okay, so prevention, range of motion, strength, and pain and function are a few broad categories that physical therapists can focus on after a patient has this type of surgery. The rehab proce process typically starts either the day of surgery or the day after surgery. In Patty's case, physical therapy started the day after surgery with BID treatment for the next two days. The initial examination was recorded in a SOAP format, subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. In the subjective part of the examination, Patty complained of increased pain in her left greater than right lower extremity, which was five out of 10 at rest and eight out of 10 with movement. She was agreeable to therapy, alert and oriented times three. Family was present during the initial examination. Her sons had come and so did her daughter. And the patient reported numbness in her left lower extremity greater than her right when seated at the edge of the bed. And this is where I was thinking it could be due to the pain medications or just her, her slow recovery from the anesthesia. Patty's weight bearing is tolerated on both lower extremities. Her upper extremity motion was within normal limits. In the lower extremities, her motion is limited in flexion and extension due to the surgery. Strength testing her knees was not performed due to the surgery, but strength testing in her, in her lower extremities did reveal that the left ankle was weaker than the right ankle, which could be caused because of the decreased sensation. She might not have been, been able to feel my hand on her foot and pulling her foot up. So, uh, dermatome. dermatome and proprioception testing were performed in both lower extremities which resulted in diminished sensation in both feet. Uh, setting, or sitting and standing posture were also analyzed and revealed that she had a tendency to forward flex and requires verbal cues to maintain good posture. Both static and dynamic balance, balance testing were measured. Patty was able to sit at the edge of the bed for 60 seconds with the use of her arms. However, when standing, Patty required a mod assist of one and the rolling walker. Since Patty was not able to stand without assistance, dynamic standing balance was deferred to a later date. For bed mobility, Patty required mod assist of one for lower extremity management and to help pivot in bed. She required mod assist of one for all transfers and was only able to ambulate five feet from the bed to the chair with a max assist of one and the rolling walker. The patient demonstrated difficulty with ambulation and transfer. She did very poorly requiring a max assistive one for ambulation and a mod assistive one for all transfers. She ambulated only five feet with a rolling walker with a forward flex posture. Her left knee was buckling, decreased foot clearance, a wide base of support, and improper weight shift. This patient is a high risk for fall secondary to the above mentioned deficits and will continue to benefit from skilled inpatient PT to increase functional mobility and to assist with discharge planning. And our plan for this patient was to see her two times a day for three to five days. The patient's goal was to be able to walk without increased pain. And our goals for her were with, within, to be met within three days. Um, because in the hospitals now you're saying so, the length of stay is so short and she was going to rehab 
a rehab program, so we were only going to see her for three days. So uh, these goals consisted of improving bed mobility, transfers, ambulation distance, balance, to negotiate steps, increase her, endur her endurance, and to be independent with the home exercise program. The second day after surgery, Patty began her therapeutic exercises, which consisted, consisted of heel slides and terminal knee extensions to increase her range of motion, short arc quads and long arc quads, and isometric contractions to increase her strength, ankle pumps to increase circulation, and daily ambulation to increase endurance and ambulation distance. Patty continued her rehabilitation in acute rehab at St. Luke's Hospital. The admission criteria for the acute rehab includes brain injury, stroke, joint replacements, which Patty had and she had a bilateral, both of her joints replaced, uh, hip fractures, amputations, multiple trauma, spinal cord injury, and neurological disorders. During acute rehab, patients are seen BID Monday through Saturday for three hours a day for 12 to 14 days. Exercises included strengthening, range of motion, and gait training. Before discharging a patient, it's important to make sure that the patient has the appropriate equipment as well as the goals, as well as if she has met her goals, such as adequate range of motion in her knees to negotiate stairs. After Patty completed acute rehab, she was able to return home and continued PT and outpatient rehab. Here are some ethical issues that I thought of regarding this patient. Uh, is it necessary to perform surgery on a woman who's 80 plus years old? In my opinion, yes it is, absolutely. Patty's a woman who's motivated and wants to regain her busy lifestyle. She understands the risk from surgery and has decided, with the approval and the help of her family, that this surgery can increase her quality of life. Another thought is what can she gain from the surgery? It's a very extensive, long rehabilitation process. And Patty and the family understand the rehabilitation process and want to continue with the procedure. She, Patty plans to walk more and, anti, and participate in regular physical therapy to get back to her prior level of function. Throughout the entire rehabilitation process, it's very important to have good interaction between all medical professionals, such as doctors, nurses, occupational therapists, and physical therapy assistants. Patty was one of the first patients I treated during my internship. She's a typical patient with a bilateral total knee arthroplasty surgery. However, her motivation is why I chose to do this presentation. Although there's no such thing as a typical patient, Patty set the gold standard for the following patients I had with a similar surgery. <laughs> 